Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Amy McCready, who's founder of Positive Parenting Solutions and author of, if I have to tell you one more time, the revolutionary program that gets your kids to listen without nagging, reminding, or yelling. She's a regular parenting contributor to the Today Show, and she lives with her husband and two teenage sons in Raleigh, North Carolina. Amy, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me, John. This is a great book that we're going to talk about today, and it's called The Me, Me, Me Epidemic, A Step-by-Step Guide to Raising Capable, Grateful Kids in an Over-Entitled World. And it just struck my fancy when I read about what was in the book uh, because I'm experiencing some problems with various children, not my own, but (laughs) other people's. And so I'd like to start with the, the fact that you establish the epidemic of entitlement. The first chapter is called Kids Rule But Should They? Uh, let's talk about how we've created a kid-centered world a little bit. Yes, and you know, of course entitlement isn't a real disease, but it does feel like it's hit epidemic proportions in the past few decades. And, and working with parents over the years, I kept hearing these stories over and over and over again. And mm-hmm. to your point, you know, how did we get here? How did we get to the point where kids feel like it is all about them, that they are the center of the universe? You know, there are some societal factors that play into this. You know, certainly the fact that we don't need our kids to contribute for the family to survive anymore like we did back in the days on the farm. So that is a huge shift. Technology mm-hmm. plays a role in this. Social media, um, you know, just the availability of Stuff. Anything our kids could want or desire can be found in a big box store or online. So there are a lot of things in society, but I think the biggest contributor to the entitlement epidemic is us, parents who love our people more than anything. But in the name of love, we tend to overindulge, we overprotect, overpamper, overpraise. We jump through hoops to make our kids happy and meet their endless demands. And in doing so, it leads our kids to believe that they are the center of the universe and everything should revolve around them. Mm-hmm. And and that's really um, unproductive for the kid's whole life. I mean, you talk about um, some of the th- some of the hoops parents jump through, like resorting to bribes and rewards to get cooperation, and um, running stuff to school that they forgot to bring, and um, being manipulated to to get their way. Um, and when they make others bend to their will. Um, we're creating a person who'll have trouble holding down a job and cultivating healthy relationships and stuff like that. Absolutely. You know, entitled kids aren't just difficult to live with at home. You know, you'll hear teachers talk about this all the time. You know, kids who don't do well on the test. Well, the test was too hard. The teacher doesn't like me. Entitled kids expect to get A's for just showing up. Um, Coaches complain about, you know, kids expecting a starting spot without working hard and and putting in the time and effort. These entitled kids, if, if we don't turn around this entitlement epidemic, will turn into needy employees that need pats on the back constantly, and high-maintenance spouses that are equally difficult to live with. So uh, Mm -hmm. it's not just a problem for the short term. It really is a long-term problem as well. Yeah, I I do want to talk about social media, but I did want to mention, amongst other things kids see on media, they see the Kardashians, right? (laughs) Yeah, reality TV has reinforced the it's all about me attitude. And, you know, Mm -hmm. social media, of course, kids posting selfies of themselves every other minute. Again, we're just perpetuating that, you know, look at me, look at what I'm doing, look at what I have um, mentality rather than, you know, serving and giving and, and, and fostering the attitudes that we want for kids to be successful in the real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you have, uh, the, the support of a, of a well-known psychologist, Alfred Adler. Can we talk about those principles just a minute, the premises of Alfred Adler's, uh, psychology? Sure. And, and Alfred, you know, All of the tools that I've talked about in this book and my previous book and in my online training programs are all based on Adlerian principles. And and Adlerian principles start with the idea that people, children, have two primary needs, and that is for a sense of belonging and significance. And so when I refer to belonging, that means feeling connected, having emotional connection to mom and or dad, to their siblings in the classroom. They need to feel connected, even as adults. That's why we belong to groups, and we need to feel connected within our workplace. That's just a a natural human need. 
And then the other piece is significance. And significance comes from uh, making a difference, that feeling of I contribute. I'm not just taking up space here. I contribute. I make a difference. I matter. And we all have those needs. And, and Alfred Adler said that if we can address those two primary emotional needs, we can fend off most misbehavior because most misbehavior comes from the child's uh, attempts at achieving those needs for belonging and significance. And you could even substitute the words attention and power to make it even um, simpler for, pe for people to understand. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that this is not a book on punishment or tricks to get your kids to behave, um, but what works in terms of punishment and discipline? Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, I really try, and, and most educators in positive parenting will differentiate between punishment and discipline. So let's just talk about the word discipline. You know, it comes from the Latin root disciplus, or disciple would be the word we would use today. Um, and as a verb, it would mean to teach or to train. And so discipline is using strategies that teach our kids to make better choices in the future, to teach them to be the best that they can be, whereas punishment is um, sort of backward focus. So it's it's inflicting some harsh uh, pain or circumstance. Um, in the positive discipline world, we talk about blame, shame, or pain. So it's inflicting blame, shame, or pain for something that the child did in the past, thinking that that's going to deter him from doing that again in the future. And that may work in the short term, but unfortunately, just focusing on blame, shame, and pain doesn't teach the child to do anything differently in the future. Mm -hmm. And if you think about kids are no different than adults. You know, if you if people made you feel bad and humiliated for the poor choices you made at work, you wouldn't be inspired to do better. You'd just be resentful and and sometimes even revengeful. And that's what happens with our kids. Mhm. Mm well, it, it's uh it's a little sad to me sometimes that we can't apply corporal punishment, but it doesn't really work. But neither does time out and counting to three sometimes. What's that about? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, you know, time out, I think, became very popular as an alternative to spanking. And certainly, you know, if you're going to pick one or the other, I'd rather have parents do time out. But the reason it typically doesn't work long term, again, it gets back to that issue of it doesn't really teach kids to do anything different. So you send the kid to the naughty chair or to the corner or his room for five minutes so he can think about his behavior. Most kids don't go there and think, wow, I really messed up this time. If I was going to do this over, mm -hmm. what would I do differently? You know, they just don't do that. And for a mm -hmm. strong-willed child, it typically escalates the power struggle because it becomes a test of wills where the parent is, you know, has to keep the kid in time out, and the kid's having none of that. And so they're, they're pulling every antic they can to get out of time out. So it's just not super effective for long term. Same thing with counting mm -hmm. one, two, three. It may work in the short term for, for young kids, but typically parents find that, um, you know, the, the kids start counting with them and, you know, it disrupts the behavior in the moment, but it doesn't teach the child to do anything differently for the future. Now, now you have some 35 tools in this book, and we obviously won't be able to cover them all in this interview, but let's start with the principles of needing to belong and feel significant with the first unentitler, mind, body, and soul time, because I think this is a good one. Yes, and you know what? If, if parents only take one tool from this book, let it be this one, because okay. it is giving kids what they truly are entitled to, and that's us, our time and attention. And that's where I see, you know, one of the biggest shifts in parenting with our busy, crazy, chaotic lives that – the one-on-one -on -one time with our kids is what tends to fall off the radar. And remember that attention bucket, that sense of belonging that our kids have, they need that emotional connection from us, and that comes from one-on-one -on -one time. So it can be as little as 10 to 15 minutes a day of one-on-one -on -one time doing whatever the child likes to do. So they know, the child knows that in that moment, nothing is more important to mom or dad than spending that time with me. That will fend off so much of the negative behavior, make kids so much more cooperative. But if we're not doing that piece, if we're not meeting the child's hardwired, non-negotiable need for belonging and significance, the other tools are simply not going to be as effective. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned that, that parents who consistently use this Describe it as a magic bullet, a game changer. But so many of us look at our day and say, how can I spend 10 to 15 minutes with each of my three children? I am so busy. Yeah. 
Exactly. And, and that is, I mean, I, I feel that pain because my life is chaotic like that as well. But here's the deal. We're going to spend that time regardless. We're gonna, we can spend it on the front end, giving them the one-on-one time, or we can spend it fussing and nagging and negotiating about all the things that they want, that we're trying to get them to do. The great thing about mind, body, and soul time is it is truly an investment in time. Whatever time we put in, we get that back tenfold in good behavior. The other thing that we can do is um, sort of do a little bit of a rebranding strategy. So most parents are doing some sort of a bedtime routine. So we can turn bedtime into mind, body, and soul time. But in that time, it's just one parent, one child. There's no other siblings around. And you're truly focused. You're not, you know, moving them through the bedtime routine, chop, 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 let's get this done and that done. You are truly focused in the moment, present in mind, body, and soul, doing what that child wants to do. If that's the only time you can do it, use bedtime as the opportunity. However, you'll get um, even more bang for your buck if you can spend some other time in the day doing something, playing something, doing something that the child likes to do. That will get, uh, mm-hmm. as I said, you'll get that time back in good behavior for sure. Uh-huh. And, and I think that's important. It's uh, like making deposits to the emotional bank account, as Stephen Covey framed it, uh, 110% present with them, controlling the other siblings' interruptions, um, it's, it's really a tough thing to do, uh, but it, it seems like the payoff is really there. Yes, and you'll find that your kids get used to it. So, you know, at first, they're interrupting their siblings because they're jealous. They want, they, you know, they want that time and attention from mom, and they feel like the only way to get that is to interrupt. But once you do some training on how this is going to work, and this is our new plan, and this is going to be, you know, get the kids involved in figuring out the schedule, who's going to get their special time, when and where, um, if you get them involved in the process, you know, within a week of starting this, they'll, they'll fall right into the routine, and they're going to love it. They're going to want that special time with you. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things I like about the way you've written this book is when you give a tool, then you, you uh, offer what parents would probably say, yes, but. And yes. there are a lot of yes, buts for MBST, like I travel for work, or can I take MBST as a punishment or to take it away? And teens think it's stupid. Let's talk about some of those. Let's talk about work. I'm, I'm away from a home during the week and only home on the weekends. What do you do? Yes. So you do the best you can. So on the weekends, I recommend a little longer time. So like maybe you have a date. So it's an hour instead of, you know, a a 10-minute block of time. Remember that our kids must have that attention from us, and they're going to get it. They're going to get it in in positive ways through mind, body, and soul time, or they're going to get our attention through acting out and and misbehavior. So if you can do a little date, dates don't have to cost money. They can just be taking a walk, going outside, and throwing the football around. It's whatever your child loves to do. That's the best way to handle it. Uh, I like your suggestions of a bike ride or a game of Monopoly, but one thing that always meant a lot to me is my parents would read to me, and I really liked that a lot. Kids love that. And, you know, even if it's just like you you start a chapter book and you do one chapter a night or, you know, whatever, they love that. Um, You mentioned teens. You know, my teen thinks this is stupid. Well, if you have sort of some existing power struggles going on with that teen, you may not want to make a huge announcement that we're going to start doing special time together because they're going to be like, yeah, whatever. But you just sort of make it happen. So whatever your teen is doing, you go and do that thing. So if they're shooting hoops in the drive, Way, you go out and you join in. Or if they're playing a video game, I, I don't love for mind, body, and soul time to be video or technology based. However, with tweens and teens, if that's what they're into and that's your entree to, to spending that time with them, that's what you do. You get them to teach you how to play, even if you're terrible at it. It doesn't matter. The key thing is you're doing what they want to do. You're getting into their world and making those emotional connections. And like I said, the benefits are, are, are too numerous to mention. One last thing on MBST before we uh, leave it and go to something else, and that is an important question is should both parents do MBST, mind, body, and soul time? Yes, because both parents should do mind, body, and soul time because our kids need emotional connection to both parents if there are two parents in the home. So, um, again, you 
if if one parent is has a very busy work schedule, you just try maybe that parent does it as part of the bedtime routine. You try to make it work the best that you can, but I'm going to ask you to just be very intentional about this piece because it's so important in terms of getting good behavior, and it's giving kids what they are truly entitled to, and that's you. Mm-hmm. Let's do the flip side because I I, I think uh, if MBST is the greatest tool. The biggest contributor to the entitlement epidemic is the great give-in, and you talk a lot about that and describe some scenarios that I'm so familiar with, like when the kid throws a tantrum because he can't have the plastic dinosaur cup that costs a lot, or there's this long, intense negotiation, and people are staring at you, and the kid is yelling, and the kid is winning, basically, is what's mm-hmm. happening, and, and then you give in. Absolutely. Why do we pay? Everyone, every one of us has done this, right? Uh, But again, Mm -hmm. this is that issue of short-term parenting versus long-term. In the short term, it's just easier to give in because you can get through the grocery store. You don't have to have, you know, this big scene. But it just reinforces to our kids that they can throw a tantrum. They can manipulate adults to get what they want. Now, as parents, we do have to be careful because sometimes kids just have bad days or kids who don't have the, um, the, the, you know, verbal skills to communicate what they want. Sometimes, you know, sometimes there are other things at play. But most parents know when it is a manipulative tantrum sort of that I am not getting my way and I'm going to throw a total fit until I do. So there are some some number of tools in the book to help parents with that. But the key thing that we want to remember is that kids continue doing the behaviors that work for them. So if mm-hmm. the behavior works to get what they want, well, guess what? They're going to use that behavior again. So if whining and negotiating and badgering and throwing a tantrum gets them what they want, it proves to them that that behavior is very effective and they're going to continue it again and again. So our challenge is to remove the payoff. So don't give in when those those manipulative behaviors are happening. But, of course, at other times we want to make sure that we're giving kids the attention they need and the power they need in more positive ways. And one thing you said in there, and it really struck me because I – I have that. I'm old enough to have that. I don't understand these kids today attitude. Um, it seems today kids are accustomed to getting what they want, often right when they want it. And, you know, I grew up in a children should be seen and not heard world. And I just don't know how we got to this point. Well, I think in large part it comes back to technology because. With technology, everything is instant gratification. You can't find a kid in a restaurant or waiting in a dentist office without an iPad or an iPhone in his hand, right? We have to keep Mm -hmm. kids busy and not bored and entertained at all times. So it's almost as if they can't function just, you know, sitting and waiting and being quiet in the restaurant or the dentist office. We parents feel like we have to jump through hoops to provide that entertainment to them. So, again, I think it's one of these things that has sort of happened slowly but surely over time, of course, all in the name of love. But, you know, we have created these kids that do feel like they can manipulate adults to get what they want when they want it. Mm -hmm. And and before we look at at, uh, giving up, giving in, uh, let's talk a little bit about the entitlement tools kids use. Whining seems to be a most popular one. Yes. And so in the book, I sort of, you know, in a comical way, talk about the kids' manual because I've provided this manual for parents, but I joke and say that kids have their own manual with their own set of tools. And so whining is one of those tools that kids have, and I explain how that, you know, kids teach each other that you you keep it up and louder and longer and you have to wear your parent down, and if it doesn't work the first time, you keep at it. And so, but that is what happens because when when a child starts whining, what do we typically do? We pick the child up or we give in fine whatever have the cookie before dinner just stop whining but again (laughs) we're providing a payoff to that behavior the behavior is working for the child she whined Mm -hmm. and she got what she wanted so of course she's going to use that behavior again and again Mm -hmm. so let's talk briefly about stopping giving in you talk about starting small revealing the rule and sticking to your ground and those three steps seem very simple but not always easy 
That's right. And, and again, throughout, you know, throughout the book, a lot of the tools are based on those basic principles of sort of revealing in advance what the expectations are, whether that's for doing family jobs around the house, what your family rules are, what your technology expectations are. We always want to make sure that we reveal in advance so kids are perfectly clear on our expectations. I encourage parents to have the kids repeat back just so we're on the same page. What, what is our new rule for XYZ, and then follow through. So if kids cannot follow the rules and we've revealed consequences in advance, we're going to follow through each and every time. Um, If they try to negotiate or badger their way out of the rule, well, we're going to stay firm because if we don't stay firm, there's no point in having the rule in the first place. So what we're doing is creating this consequential environment where kids know that there are rules, there are limits, and those are firm. They can't be negotiated, they can't be badgered, they can't be whined about to change, and mom and dad are going to follow through and, and, and see those through each and every time. And if kids learn that at home, then they also learn that the world you know, there's a consequential environment with the world. If you don't pay your electric bill, they're going to turn off your service. If you speed on the highway, you're going to get a ticket. So they're going to learn a consequential, or they're going to learn consequentiality one way or another. They can learn it at home in our safe environment where the stakes aren't so high, or they're going to learn it in the outside world, which is going to be a much more difficult lesson to learn. You had mentioned the the self-sufficient farm and how, you know, the economy has changed and so has lifestyle. So let's talk about getting kids to help around the house. How do you go about making them a part of the solution? (laughs) Yeah, so the fact remains that we don't need for our kids to contribute, right? We're still going to eat if the kids, you know, the kids don't have to be, you know, picking crops or milking cows or whatever for the family to have food. But we do we want them to contribute because it's important for them. And I think part of it is the mindset. We want to adopt the mindset that everybody in our family contributes, toddlers to teens. Everybody helps out around here. And we do that because we're part of the family. Not because we're getting paid for it, but because we're part of the family and everybody's contributions are important. Remember back to that significance we talked about, that primary human need of significance? When I help out around here, I make a difference for the greater good. And then at each stage, so toddlers all the way up to teens, everybody should have responsibilities, daily contributions and then weekly contributions. So the daily stuff can be age appropriately, you know, like make your bed, um, uh, clean the room, you know, tidy up the whatever, you know, whatever the things are that they do on a daily basis set the table, and then there's weekly jobs. Those are things that don't have to be done every day, like maybe it's emptying the trash, mowing the lawn, whatever those things are. So through the years, kids get experience and skill development in basically all of the household tasks that have to be done. And I like to call those family contributions rather than chores because it sends the message that when you do these things, you make a difference. You contribute to our family, and our family could not function without you. That's a much different paradigm than calling it a chore, which is just drudgery to everybody. Yes, indeed. And you have a wonderful list of age-appropriate tasks that I think will be helpful for parents that don't know where to start. We've been talking with Amy McCready, and the book is The Me, Me, Me Epidemic. It's an excellent read with lots of good tools for parents. Uh, I hope you'll listen to our broadcast during the week. But if you don't get a chance to do that, you can catch us on YouTube channel, Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. We are underwritten by audiobooks.com. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening.